Hello, everybody. Thank you for for coming to see me. I understand I have I have some stiff competition with what's going on next door. So thank you, thank you. Um, not sure where some of this introduced me, but my name is Daisy Cousins, as you know, and I am a conservative freelance journalist. I write for The Spectator, and I write for Quadrant. And it's lovely to see you all. So I'll begin. But I'm dropping everything. That's all right. Okay. Well. In April 2017, I wrote an article for The Spectator, which was entitled The Curious Case of Third Wave Feminists. It was bashed out at around two in the morning when I was exhausted and in a thoroughly vitriolic mood, which are the conditions that, funnily enough, enable my best work. So to quote myself, which I like to do, the third wave feminist is a curious creature her comrades are a strange substrata of millennial and Generation X women with a peculiar inferiority complex. They're obsessed with picking at the scab of women's lib, trying to draw fresh blood, and are often seen prowling or lumbering around, attempting to sniff out sexism in every nook and cranny. Theirs is an ideology based not on equality, but misplaced victimhood. The article was my response to two months of relentless hounding by pretty much every feminist journalist, public figure, and troll in Australia. They couldn't stand the fact that a woman, least of all a millennial woman, had dared not only to break ranks, but to publicly affirm views they considered a threat to their stranglehold over the young. The threat I posed was not just ideological. The very concept of me terrified them. There was I, 28, thin, wearing frills and lace and bright red lipstick and more than happy to flaunt my appearance as a feminine woman. I was and still am broadcasting everything feminists loathe to a platform of millions. I didn't realize it until afterwards, but when I popped up on that episode of Q&A in February 2017, seemingly out of the blue and looking like something out of a Jane Austen novel, I represented the antithesis of everything modern feminism so fervently covets. How could a young woman not only have a liking for Donald Trump, but go, yes, but go on national television, yes, have a round of applause, thank you. But go on national television, on the notoriously left-leaning ABC, and call him Uncle Donnie. <laughs> <laughs> or wear unashamedly girly clothes designed to pull and hold the male gaze. Or, worst of all, admit that I used to call myself a feminist, but proudly ditched the label when I found the ideology wanting. And frighteningly enough, be met not with universal condemnation, but with at least some praise. It's no wonder they wanted to get rid of me and were happy to use every dirty trick in the book to do it. At the time I wrote the article, I felt a great sense of not only anger, but betrayal. You see, the women who routinely stalked, denigrated, and ridiculed me posited themselves as vehement advocates for increasing the number of women in the mainstream arena. They seemed desperate to enable more women to publicly express their many and varied, quintessentially female views. And there appeared to be no conditions or restrictions in the feminist manifesto as to what those views may or may not be. So you can imagine my confusion as to what happened next. Here was I, a woman whose abilities had been recognized over that of many male conservative journalists, given a public platform to express her opinions. Now this would seem a textbook win for, them, for feminism, I would have thought. Yet the response of Feminist Australia was not to celebrate the fact they had another woman treading the boards of public opinion, or to enter into a diplomatic, facts-based discussion about where we disagreed, which I would have welcomed and encouraged. Instead, their reaction was to kick and scream and bitch and whine and moan and complain that I wasn't expressing the correct views for a woman to have. And for that, I not only had to be silenced, but actively punished 
in the most personal, vicious way possible. As such, it was starkly revealed to me that while feminists claim to want more female voices in the mainstream, they really only want female voices there that agree with them. And any female that contradicts the feminist agenda is automatically a target for ruthless character assassination. Now, when called out on this bad behavior, feminists try to excuse it by insisting that feminism doesn't necessarily denote an obligation to support all women. Now, this is true. However, feminists claim that women as an identity group should be treated with respect, particularly when expressing an opinion. There is no clause anywhere stating any exceptions. Therefore, in the realm of public opinion giving, feminists actually do have an obligation to treat other women with at least respect, if not support. Not to do so would be to undercut the very crux of feminism and render feminists the most appalling hypocrites. Yet for some reason, it's okay to continually bypass this little condition whenever a conservative woman shows her painstakingly made up face. We defy the laws of identity politics, which is a grievous sin in the eyes of leftists, and for that, we must be stopped. Now I should clarify, I am not relaying this information to you to play the victim, because women on the right don't do that. Playing the victim, yes. We don't do it. Playing the victim and engaging in a cushy groupthink flies totally in the face of our favored libertarian and conservative ideals of freedom, individual autonomy, incentive, and personal responsibility. However, it is very important to note in any critique of feminism that according to the left, the protections of anti-sexism do not apply to women on the right. <clears throat> The reason this rank hypocrisy must be highlighted again and again is because it rips a giant hole right through the middle of feminist dogma. It reveals that modern feminism is no longer about women's equality, nor is it about female solidarity empowering each other against all odds. This vicious, no questions asked, take no prisoners animosity of feminists towards conservative women points squarely to the fact that rather than a battle of oppressed versus oppressor, it has become a war of left versus right. Feminists have become nothing more than cultural Marxists looking to push their pack mentality agenda by whatever means necessary, even if it means engaging in the behavior they claim to hate in order to shut their opposition the hell up. Now, while right-wing women don't tend to care too much about this, it does make battling feminists incredibly daunting. It's not a secret that the only thing feminists hate more than men is the young conservative woman. Our very existence undermines the core narrative of their ideology, and that is that all women are oppressed by men. And as third wave feminists tend to possess a kind of intellectual laziness, debating women on the right with facts will never be their preferred method of retaliation. This indicates either extraordinary ignorance or a lack of confidence in their own ideology. And my God, does that ever show when you take them on about something as baseless as the gender pay gap? Now, to mask this intellectual weakness, feminists have no problem attempting to humiliate their female opposition into submission using the same commentary they would denounce as the worst kind of misogyny if uttered by a man to one of their own. The three best, most recent examples of this are Kellyanne Conway, who, as the first woman ever to lead a successful US election campaign, should be a feminist icon, but for the fact she has the wrong politics. Melania Trump, who isn't even a political figure, but is married to the wrong man and looks fabulous in a swimsuit. <laughs> and, I guess, and me. But we will get to that later. So to left-wing feminists, conservative women aren't actual women. They are deficient in some way, having either capitulated to the patriarchal dominion of men to serve their own interests, or are too dumb to think for themselves. That, or they're just attention-seeking. I have been accused of all three. The narrative that prominent Australian feminist journalists tried to spin when I emerged onto the public scene was that I was a ditzy opportunist who had hoard her way 
into the good graces of powerful conservative men in order to benefit financially. Especially since I actually used to write for an online women's lifestyle magazine. It was all too easy for the Aussie feminazi hordes to insist I had done an ideological flip purely to make more money and to gain notoriety. Little did they know that actually, the most money I ever made as a journalist was writing for that women's magazine. Primarily about celebrity gossip, lipstick, and sex. Not politics. However, it would have been incomprehensible for them to accept that a right-wing woman had been left to her own devices to formulate her own opinions. And I'm fairly sure they still believe I am being coerced in some way or another. But what feminists don't seem to realize is that nowadays, being conservative, or at least publicly stating the fact you're, no, you're not a feminist, epitomizes a woman thinking for herself of boldly going against the grain and risking enormous backlash in the process. See, over the last few years, feminism has gone mainstream. Try as they might to deny it, being a feminist is no longer some niche symbol of resistance. It is an expected trope of female identity politics and an increasingly boring one at that. Calling yourself a feminist is by far the safest option, both in the public and private realms. You won't be questioned on it, and if you're antagonized, the noisy left will leap to your defense. Feminism is the official doctrine of acceptable thought, and there is no longer anything original, interesting, or controversial about adopting its principles. As such, it is now conservative women who are rocking the boat in terms of what a, wo a woman should and shouldn't think, do, or say which is the very, very worst possible thing that could have happened to feminism. Staging slut walks and screeching fight the patriarchy is now about as edgy and countercultural as pink fairy floss. <laughs> if you're a woman and you really want to freak people out, broadcast publicly that you think society could benefit from a return to traditional gender roles. <laughs> <laughs> because women instinctively prioritize the nurturing of children, which is not untrue, or that fat positive Instagram bloggers are appallingly irresponsible and should have their accounts suspended as a danger to public health. <laughs> or even, and this is horribly controversial even for me, in order for long-term happiness, women should focus primarily on securing a man before they're 30 rather than climbing the career ladder because a woman's sexual market value deteriorates with her fertility. <laughs> now this kind of provocative right-wing eschewing of identity politics is what makes heads explode, not whinging about mansplaining and sexist air conditioning. <laughs> That's a thing, you should YouTube that. <laughs> now, deep down, feminist leaders know this. They'd have to. Women in the Western world have, by law, every opportunity available to men. We benefit from a cultural disdain for and a court system that punishes rape, sexual harassment, wage disparity, gender discrimination, and other atrocities. However, we have been unable to enjoy it because a bunch of self-absorbed, middle-class malcontents are running around telling us how terrible we should think our lives are. It's very irritating. Feminists have quite literally run out of things to complain about, which in the fight for women's equality would seem a good thing, you would have thought. But rather than celebrating victory and reaping the rewards, Feminists keep inventing new things to whine about. If they didn't, not only would they be facing a purposeless existence, they would go out of business. Modern feminism is, amongst other things, a money-making exercise. And chillingly, the only way to profit is to make other women feel really, really terrible about themselves. 
Feminists do this by telling outright lies, like insisting that even though it has been illegal for decades to pay women less than men for the same work, somehow women will be gypped of equal pay across the board for the rest of their lives because of some misrepresented, non-existent gender pay gap. Now this generates a sense of hopelessness and causes women to flock to feminist chiefs as seemingly their only source of comfort. Now the two most effective means of achieving this are by promoting the concept of victimhood while uniting women against a common enemy, the straight white man. This absolves women of any responsibility for anything wrong with their lives and strangles them with the mantle of mediocrity. <coughs> They end up trapped in a sort of banal limbo with only one apparent option for salvation, feminism. Feminist leaders relentlessly peddle these lies and histrionics to vulnerable women, which demolishes their self-esteem and drives a dagger through the heart of male-female relations. They are so convincing in their dogma, they have their adherents believing that the very act of a man sitting with his legs slightly spread is a vast patriarchal conspiracy designed to deprive women of public space, otherwise known as manspreading. <laughs> These tactics are not for female empowerment. Such hyperbole is propagated only so feminists can sell out lectures and books. It is an economic strategy Machiavellian in its efficiency. As such, regardless of, the insist of their insistence that women should feel empowered, feminists actually don't like confident women because they won't buy into the victimhood bubble and therefore can't be controlled by this concept of victimhood. So instead, the only women who are useful to feminist leaders are conventionally unattractive, probably not too bright, boyfriendless in the case of heterosexual women, misinterested in the case of lesbians, all of which in some, pub, in some bumbling way do not fit the mold of typical femininity. Once feminist leaders have roped in these anxious, ugly ducklings, <laughs> no, I don't, didn't like, I don't mean literally ugly, I mean like insecure. <laughs> They are assigned a place on what I like to call the victimology scale, which is usually based on skin color. So the darker their complexion, the higher they rank, and the more victim points they score. Now these victim points are doled out according to the rules of intersectionality, which is a form of feminism that involves finding multiple things other than gender to blame for how horrible your life is. All women get at least one point for being women except for conservative women who can go and die. <laughs> However, if you are a white woman, you get less points than if you're black. If you're Muslim, you get even more points than that, but if you're Christian, you score much lower, even if you're female and black. So if you're a female, black, trans, Muslim midget with epilepsy, <laughs> you can pretty much rule the leftist universe if you want to. After their place on the victimology scale is determined, these insecure women are drilled with the idea that the only way for women to be free-thinking, happy human beings is to bust through the bounds of a weird, invisible, malevolent force called the patriarchy, taking out as many innocent male bystanders as they can in the process, of course. When you lay out third-wave feminism like this, it all sounds a bit ridiculous. To be drawn into that sinkhole is to be a very foolish human being. <coughs> it's no wonder then that this cesspool of self-deprecation and rampant unhappiness doesn't appeal to confident, self-satisfied women who are happy to stand on their own two feet. And as such, confident women therefore tend to gravitate towards libertarianism and conservatism. This is because Aside from the fact that according to a 2014 study in the Journal of Public Economics, we tend to be hotter than left-wing women. <laughs> this is, no, this is true, you can actually Google that, it's very interesting. <laughs> we find the responsibility that comes with liberty to be very appealing. Our modus operandi is centered on individualism, not collectivism. And unlike collectivism's promise of having the pact to fall back on when things get tough, 
The isolation of individualism involves a certain degree of risk, which allows libertarian and conservative-minded women to thrive. We won't allow ourselves to be controlled by the mob, which renders us not only useless to feminists, but a grave danger that must be eradicated. So, how do you as a right-wing woman deal with the sheer onslaught of vitriol that comes from the feminist left whenever you tentatively raise your hand to speak? The approach from conservatives over the last couple of decades has been to smile politely, comply with the speech codes of the left to placate them lest they throw a characteristic tantrum, and blindly trust that eventually they'll come around because common sense will triumph. Needless to say, this hasn't worked. It is thanks to the tepid bleating of stuck-in-the-mud traditionalist conservatives who continue to refuse to raise their right-wing swords in the face of battle who are responsible for the giant feminist-shaped blockade in the way of young conservative women's free speech. It has made my job a lot harder. And while I can acknowledge George Bernard Shaw's infamous quote, never wrestle with a pig, you'll get dirty, and besides, the pig likes it. <laughs> Sometimes, when the ground gets a little too muddy, you don't have much of a choice. I once wrestled with a pig. Her name is Clementine Ford. <laughs> picked a fight with me. <laughs> on February 6th of this year, during my debut on Q&A, which was my first ever live panel television experience. Now that's called being thrown in the deep end, but it was a lot of fun. <laughs> she fanned the flames of this fight through what can ironically only be described as a campaign of online misogyny. Throughout the program, she tweeted, it always happens on Twitter, she tweeted some very choice things about me, like, did Daisy Cousins win a competition to get on Q&A? She does have very nice hair, one point for her hair. Why are both the women on the panel right wing? Which is very telling. Do you think Daisy Cousins has ever met an Arab? To which I thought, well, I've met enough of them to know not to call them Arabs. <laughs> and so on. She had no idea who I was at the time, or where I'd come from, or even what my views on feminism were. It was enough for her to know that I was younger than her, with better skin, and right wing. I was automatically the enemy which needed to be crushed. Over the next two months, the online commentary got worse and worse. Clementine, egged on by her nearly 100,000 or so followers on Twitter, would do things like Google stalk me to find anything she thought might embarrass me, twist it, and tweet it. Funnily enough, she never tweeted me directly. It was always about me, never to me. So I had my Twitter spies keep track of what she was saying. They informed me that she was, and probably still is, next level obsessed with me for no other reason than I refused to toe the party line. I'm actually not that interesting. Like, I'm not. I don't say or think anything that millions of people around the world don't say or agree with. It's just the identity politics of it that confused her. She would also do things like tweet my most risque women's lifestyle articles, and I've written a few, for her followers to denigrate with flagrantly inflammatory comments. I find it a little ironic that a feminist would deliberately railroad a women's magazine, but that's what they do. And after a particularly hostile night on Twitter, where I was the number one trending topic for all the wrong reasons, she referenced a joke that I posted, something about being triggered, with the comment, I thought the new way to be triggered was to write appalling erotic fan fiction and then run away from Twitter's laughter for days. Or, my personal favourite, according to these archives, Daisy Cousins used to write pop feminism. Being a boy suck pays more, I guess. Now, I moved into these commentary circles knowing full well I would cop a lot of flack, and I had been warned specifically about the cruelty of feminists. But I was simply not prepared for the sheer volume of the malicious misogyny directed at me not by men, 
but by other women. Women who claimed to be anti all of the things that they were so happily doing, led not only by Clementine, but other prominent feminists like Dee Madigan, Jane Caro, who ironically tweeted about me, is this pathetic creature trying to be our Katie Hopkins, not realizing that that's actually my dream. <laughs> Asha Wolf, Erin Riley, even Van Batten got in on the action once or twice. She has since blocked me on Twitter. <laughs> but I am ashamed to say that try as I might, I did let it get to me. It wasn't so much the words they were using. I mean, aside from the fact I did make sure I didn't read that much of it at the time, words can't physically hurt you, and trolls will always be trolls. It was the injustice of it, and the unbelievable hypocrisy that angered me. <clears throat> if these women had come at me with facts and reason and a solid argument, I would have jumped right into battle with a smile on my face. But their agenda was, of course, to engage in the most appalling personal attacks with the goal of wiping me and my ideas off the face of the planet. But that wasn't going to happen. After two months of flat out ignoring Clementine's provocations and that of her followers, I realized she wasn't going to stop. In the real world, if you ignore a bully, they will get bored and move on to a more reactionary target. However, as I learned, in the online world, they take silence as an all-access pass to say whatever they want, as often as they want. Which is amazing how tough you can be behind a keyboard. So on the 8th of April, I decided to change my tactics. One of my Twitter spies tipped me off to another of Clementine's unprovoked smutty remarks where she called an article that I had written in March flaccid erotica and said that it prompted universal cringing. After reading this characteristically sexualized swipe, I felt the blood rush to my head, and for the first time in two months, I just snapped. I was so, so angry, probably angrier in that specific moment than I had ever been about anything ever. It was what can only be described as a blind rage. How dare you, I thought. How dare you sit there behind your computer time and time again and not only deliberately seek to wound me but encourage your tens of thousands of followers to do the same when I have never met you, never insulted you, never tweeted to you or about you. All I had done was express a contrasting opinion. I realized then and there that taking the high road was never going to stop her and all I wanted her to do was stop. I had to hit back and I had to do it in a way that was as snide and vicious and personal as anything she had leveled at me. I knew this reaction was beneath me. I make a point of never making personal attacks. But I also knew that this was all that somebody like her and her trollish followers would understand. <coughs> In short, she, not I, had to be punished. So I sat there in my blind rage and thought, okay, what is the worst possible, most inflammatory, most outrageous, cutting, shocking, awful, controversial thing that I can possibly say? What is going to strike the softest nerve and cut right to the core of her ideology? Then it came to me. Clementine is a large-ish woman. <laughs> and I knew what I had to do. <laughs> In a move that I can assure you I would never ordinarily make ever, unless under severe provocation and duress, I picked up my iPhone. I tapped the reply button to this tweet, and bear in mind I'd never tweeted to her about this. This was totally out of the blue. And I feverishly typed in, and I'm very ashamed of it, Darling, sit down. When was the last time you could wear horizontal stripes? Oh. <laughs> it was so mean. Accompanied by, no, 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 there's more. 
It, accompanied by a photo of myself, which is somewhere on my Instagram, taken from a very flattering angle, looking very skinny in horizontal stripes. I followed that up immediately with anyone with any class thinks you're an unimaginable pleb, it's time you realize that, you little troll. <laughs> so mean. With that, I set down my phone, folded my hands, and waited. Twitter exploded. <laughs> Nobody could believe that not only had I finally, after two months, retaliated, I had dared to break the strictest of all feminist taboos by allegedly fat shaming their fearless leader. <laughs> Clementine was so outraged that she started posting photos of her of the eggs and bacon fry up that was her breakfast to demonstrate how much she could eat without caring. And then she started tweeting about eating Nutella and, and burping. And then she did a quick you this is all in the space of about ten minutes. Then she no seriously, then she did a quick YouTube stalk and found a, a video of me singing and posted it to humiliate me, which was kind of stupid because I have trained technically as a singer for 15 years. So I, do, I sing all right. Anyway, um, so on and on this went. And then of course there was another pile on and I was trending again at number four. So I thought, no, I'm not letting this get out of control. So I just started shit posting. I was just like throwing stuff out there, retweeting Clementine and saying, oh, you know, she describes herself so well as you know, misplaced bravado, and oh, I'm training at number four, that's not enough, get me to number one, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, it was really very silly. It was very immature, very stupid. The only reason I engaged in that particular one was because I wanted them to know that I wasn't afraid anymore. And what was interesting, though, about the outrage from leftist feminist Twitter in Australia was that they were making out like I was the worst human being on the planet for doing this, which implies that they thought that everything Clementine had said about me, everything that her followers had said, and everything that other feminists had said was perfectly justified, which is very, very frightening. But as for Clementine herself, she never tweeted about me again. I have, by the way, since apologized to her for that comment on live television, which she absolutely hated, but which I meant because it was a nasty thing to say, and I would never normally say that. Now, I will re re reiterate, I am not telling you this story to play the victim. This is the distinguishing feature that marks out right-wing women from feminists. I'm not a victim. Words do not have magic powers. We choose how we react to them and how they make us feel. In my case, the nasty words uttered by Clementine and her merry band of trollish femi journalists gave me a huge amount of ideological ammunition and gained me about 2,000 more Twitter followers. So really, by haranguing me the way she did, all she did was create a monster and shoot herself in the foot. My experience of this bad behavior of feminists, to which I'm sure all the right-wing libertarian women in this room can relate to in some way, is just one way of proving that modern feminism is no longer about the equality of and the protection of women. How can it be when the protections it offers are exclusive only to women who toe the feminist line? It is simply another form of collectivist identity whose only purpose is to recruit and control rather than to empower and enrich. Cultural Marxism at its finest, hypocrisy writ large. Third wave feminism is harmful, not just to men, but to women, both on the left and the right. Its constituents must be called out ruthlessly and relentlessly for their lies, hypocrisy, and sheer idiocy again and again in the public arena. They must be routinely ridiculed and sneeringly informed that if they can't take it, they shouldn't dish it out in the first place. And of course, most importantly, Every facet of their arguments, however small, must be decimated with facts, reason, logic, and a healthy dose of flagrant sass. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is where I come in. Thank you.
a big thing about about her parents but I haven't quite been game enough to tweet it yet <laughs> yes she did actually she she took down her Facebook and her website I think apparently um, last Monday which was round about the time Tim Blair wrote that wonderful article um, about her father running for One Nation in Queensland but I'm thinking <laughs> Sure they are. I know. I um. I know her cousin actually. I know Clementine's cousin quite well. She doesn't like me very much either. <laughs> Runs in the family. Um. But no. Maybe. Maybe I. Maybe I should. Maybe that's what I'll do this afternoon. <laughs> yes. Um. What, what's your your take on why feminists won't support Muslim women, given that Islam is so misogynist and it denigrates women and it's got all kinds of horrible things that absolutely destroy women, like polygamy, like female genital mutilation, justifying domestic violence, child marriage, mm. yeah. It's an interesting question and one that a lot of people have asked and are continuing to ask. My, my take on it, um, I don't know if anyone was here for Corinne's um, panel just a little while ago, but she said, and I agree, um, they don't actually care about women. They care about they care about groupthink. They care about control, and they care about making money. Um, my what I would add to that is that feminists like to virtue signal. Um, that's much of their modus operandi is proving how moral and virtuous they are. And look at us. We're not you know we're not racist. We love Muslim women. They can they can wear whatever they want, even though it goes against our principles of, you know, women should be allowed to wear whatever they want. Well, you, you know what I'm trying to say. I think a lot of it is just is just virtue signaling. And it's it's terribly hypocritical because, I mean, if you look at, say, the that domestic violence ad campaign that the government lodged last year, where all of the perpetrators were white, middle-class men, they totally ignore, for instance, the totally disproportionate levels of domestic violence in Aboriginal communities, and in Indigenous communities. And they also ignored, feminists didn't commentate at all, on the child marriages and polygamy and child abuse and neglect that goes on in Muslim enclaves in Western Sydney. They don't, you don't hear any of that. And I, my, I honestly think it's because they remain willfully ignorant of all of this in order to virtue signal so that they look good. I think it's as simple as that. Um, Jordan Pinson had a comment on, um, on, on the unholy alliance between feminism and Islamism. Uh, he thought it was because feminism wants to destroy Western civilization. Yeah. I would, I, I would, I would definitely agree with that. I mean, a, lo a lot of, a lot of feminism. Um, what I find particularly peculiar about feminism is that they seem to want to turn women into men. And they seem not to that. Well, they don't. They have a problem with the. And this comes from the second wave feminists, from the sort of standard idea of femininity. So you know, pinks and flowers and, and tight dresses and girly things. I mean, a good example of that was um, Ivanka Trump at the G20 when she sat in for her father, wore a very stylish, soft pink dress, and there was a, a journalist at MSNBC who said she looked too girly. Um, for a professional environment, and I'm thinking, well, you're a left-wing feminist. Why, why do you think that femininity and being girly is somehow inferior to masculinity, and therefore not right for a professional environment? See, that just seems to me a contradiction in terms. But I, I participated in a slut walk, and um, I, mm -hmm. I thought I could wear what I want. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I'm being judged. Without being judged. <laughs> well, exactly, exactly. So, um. In wanting to um, destroy this idea of femininity, they want to destroy the nuclear family, they want to destroy um, the idea of women as nurturers and ones who keep a, a tidy house and all that kind of stuff. And they, the reasoning behind that is that they seem to think that women making money is the most important thing for women to do, which is typically what men did. Men were the providers, so they want to sort of push women into male roles. And while I think, of course, women should have the choice to do that, if there's some, some women are not maternal at 
at all, this idea that if women don't want to do that, if they want to choose to be in wife and mother, if they take pride in keeping a functioning home, which is what the role that women have played for thousands of years, which has been the bedrock of society, saying that's somehow a bad thing would, would seem a very anti-feminist concept to me. So yeah, I would, I would, I would say so. It's this wanting to kind of usurp Western institutions and Western civilization that makes it appealing. Any other questions? Are we out of time? Yeah. Out of time? Oh, thank you. Oh, do we have time for one more? Yeah, one more question. It's just a really quick one. Is yeah. it on Facebook? Is it Daisy Cousins or Daisy Cousins Appreciation Society? <laughs> <laughs> I did not make the Daisy Cousins Appreciation Society. I know, I know who did. They revealed themselves to me eventually, and I think they're doing a lovely job. Uh, but yes, my page is, is Daisy Cousins. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.